What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Find out every Monday at 8 on Notes from an Artist. Bassist educator, author David C. Gross, and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an Artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. Every Monday at 8 on CygnusRadio.com. And check out previous episodes on our podcast. Notes from an Artist.Buzzsprout.com. Well, our guest this evening is Gene Wisniewski, who is the author of the book, The Art of Looking at Art. Now he talks about the importance of history, that when you look at a work of art, it's important to understand the historical backdrop, what era it came out in, who were the subjects. Um, very much like music. I, I like the way we sort of made an analogy between looking at art and something like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And we posed the question, would Sgt. Pepper be as well known today if it came in a brown paper bag versus that glue? glorious cover. Right, right, the psychedelic cover. And um, very interesting the way uh, Gene discusses how art is broken down. Uh, we all have the same tools, pencil and paper, video art, really gets into a lot of interesting subjects. And again, it's really interesting to see how fine artists are much, much like musicians and writers. Not everybody does everything well, and each artist specializes in a certain area. And uh, who are the art gatekeepers and how art becomes famous almost happens by accident. Yeah, we got into a little bit of a discussion about the revolution in the 50s from Jackson Pollock to William de Kooning and it was really really a fascinating and the, the ability to sort of twist songs from everything from the GTOs Captain Beefheart the Ramones who has ever paired a Ramones tune and a Weather Report tune I'll tell you we're nuts that's just about the size of it. We managed to put the two together, that's for sure. And listen, the thing about this book that I think is most important is you don't have to be an artist to look at a piece of art, but you do need to know a little something about the artist and the time period because it really makes that piece of art so much more engaging to you. You remember it more. And one of the things, Tom, that I thought was extraordinarily interesting was the fact that one of the reasons the Mona Lisa is so popular is because it was stolen in 1911. And to think that before that it wasn't really, oh, it's, it's the Mona Lisa, but now everyone's getting into, oh, the smile, the this, who is it? And a lot of that just came out of the fact that it became a popular painting through the media, of course. It became about, popular by accident. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Without further trepidation, David, let's get to Gene Wisniewski. Enjoy the interview, folks. Welcome to the show, Gene Gene. And, Thank you. You know, David, I had the pleasure pleasure of taking an online course with Gene uh, during the COVID lockdown, or as we better well know it as the societal reset forged upon the peasants by the ruling class. I think lockdown is a little more catchy, but yeah, that works. <laughs> All right. Dr. Faustian, before we start on the art of looking at art, let's talk about the art of looking at Gene. Gene, tell us about your formative years, where you grew up and what interested you in art. Well, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, Rahway specifically. It's about 25, 30 miles from Manhattan, but it's a whole different world growing up in the right. suburbs in the 60s and 70s. I actually spoke about this with David before because he grew up in the city. I said, you know, my grandparents came all the way from Poland. They could have stopped at Greenpoint. They could have stopped at the Lower East Side, but they kept <laughs> going to Jersey. I was kind of art deprived. And the only reason I even heard about art was because somebody I graduated high school with got a scholarship to Cooper Union. And I, I suddenly kind of started looking into art. And then I went to Rutgers and I was a theater major, not an art major, but I took a couple of art classes, including with Leon Golub, who is pretty well known, uh, pretty well known artist, pretty well regarded, just had a retrospective a couple of years ago at the Met Breuer. Uh, but I didn't really start studying art until I stumbled upon the New York Art Academy in the 1980s. And this was in the middle of the whole East Village, Neo Geo, Neo Expressionism, East Village right. art scene. And I decided to go to an academic school just because I want to learn how to draw. And it turned out that that was actually a whole scene unto itself that has since grown into a school of like neo-academic art. They have a name for it and everything. A lot of people I went to school with, like Tony Ryder, Jacob Collins. They all went to school with me at the New York Art Academy. And when was this? What were the dates on this? This was like the mid-80s or so. So I was already like, what, 30-some years old when I first started to study art. So it's never too late, folks. <laughs> well, this the and Rousseau, who we're going to probably talk about, started painting in his 40s. A lot of people take it up late. Wasn't that the Keith Haring and Basquiat was really, that was all the rage in New York? 
York in the 80s. And I remember, David, you might remember also in a lot of the recording and rehearsal studios in Manhattan, the elevators and the walls had Keith hiring paintings on the wall because Keith, I think, at one point used to frequent the, the music building, which was what, David, on 8th Avenue? 30th Street, 251 30th West Street. Street. Right. And I used to see Madonna there and, and Keith Haring. And you think about it, they he would be you'd walk in on whatever floor it was and he would be painting the walls and the elevators. Exactly. So it was well, a very fertile art, time. But the art scene at the time was very music, art, all that was all tied in together. You know, right. David Wernarowicz was in Three Teens Kill Four, which was a band. He was mm-hmm. a visual artist, he was a sculptor, he made films. So a lot of people were doing a lot of things back then in East Village. That was Three Teens Kill Four doing Tell Me Something Good. This is Notes from an Artist on SidnessRadio.com. And I went to the clubs and I went to the galleries, but that's not what I wanted to do at the time. That should have been my scene, but I didn't take part in it. I went a totally different direction. Well, here's an interesting question, and it's actually two questions in one. If you really think about it, the 50s, which was the complete spoken word situation, the complete beginnings of rock and roll... And there was some artwork, morphs into the 60s, and we have pop art, we have fashion, we have the Beatles, music, theater. 70s, it sort of waned a little bit. Fashion was pretty boring, quite frankly. The 80s happened, it starts up again. Then the 90s happened. So the question is, you know, it's, it's, that was more of a statement. This is the question. What the hell happened? Since the 90s, it's sort of flatlined, don't you think? Well, I think the world, art world has gotten a lot more global. Okay. I don't know if there even is a center of the art world, because it was always Paris up until the 50s when the abstract expressionists came around. And all of a sudden, New York was the center of the art world. Then you had pop art. Then you had the 80s scene. And even in the 70s, New York was still pretty much the epicenter. But now it's, I think, global. So that's part of it. I, I think I think all these things are still tied in together, though. I think fashion and art and all music are still pretty closely related in some way or shape or form. I'm not sure that it's totally disappeared. You know, maybe okay. the art and the fashion so is less to people's taste, but I think they're all pretty tied in together still. And I always think that art, fashion, music, all these things are the basic indicators of any time period. If you study French Baroque period, you know, French rec- Poco art or something. You had fragging art, so, and you know, had Mozart. Like every, everything was kind of tied in. Like it all kind of ties into a bundle. All these things kind of define a particular time period. I think when you think about the Gap, Banana Republic, and everything, everything has become so standardized in fashion in terms of your uniform. I think I think I, just, I think a lot of I think all the arts are kind of combining into one big kind of glom of combination of everything. I think they're all tied together. I think it's that but that echoes I think what I was saying that it's a matter of taste. I don't particularly like a lot of what's going on now in a lot of fields either. You know, I I don't really find very much pop music I like very much. I mean, there's still great music out there, but it's mostly underground. Do you think that's a result of maybe the you talk about being global? And that that is very interesting in the sense that everything, uh, not so much diluted, but it's just been spread out. For example, yes, New York and Paris were art centers. London was a music center. Now, for musicians, we can create anywhere. You don't have to be in New York to create music. You don't have to be in London or Nashville or Austin or any of the centers anymore. So you know. Even when I go to London and interview uh, artists, uh, interview musicians, well, who comes up from there, you know, Birmingham or, or Manchester or different parts of England, everybody used to center in London because you had to be there because of the recording studios. And I would imagine in art, it was the same way. You had to be in Paris. You had to be in New York. But if you can distribute your art digitally, you don't have to move anywhere. You can be wherever you want to be. So I guess that kind of dilutes the art scene, local art scenes anyway. Well, I think there's also talk about things have definitely become more corporatized and I think everybody yes. wants to make a lot of money uh, but there's also you know this talk about the monoculture the worldwide monoculture that's sort of developing right. it's almost like the frozen food aisle 
know, and there's Mexican food, there's Indian food, but it's all, you know, kind of middle standardized. It's not the real thing. It's an Americanized version of it, but it has like a flavor of whatever. But it's a lot of artists, I think, getting kind of standardized, corporatized, whatever. I remember when I was in uh, Switzerland, 1989, and I walked into one of the grocery stores and there... I had never seen it before with something called Nutella, which was a sort of a chocolate peanut buttery kind of thing. Hazelnuts. Now you go into any grocery store in America, there it is. It's, I see what you're saying there. But Tom, I wanted to go back to one of the points you made. I think the reason New York, London, et cetera, I don't think it was the recording studios. I mean, that may have been a byproduct. Right. But what I really think it was, those are the towns with the clubs where you could be seen. Certainly. And certainly. And of course, the record labels were were there as well. But let's look on the bright side, Gina. We asked this of all our musician uh, colleagues. Yes, everything has been corporatized. We live in a corporate society. There's no doubt about it. The fact that you now have digital distribution, okay, where you can bring your art to anywhere. Is it the best of times or the worst of times in the sense that now Gene, if Gene wants to display his art, he doesn't have to convince an art gallery to take his material. He doesn't have to sell his wares to an agent or or someone or you know whomever, an art dealer. You can go directly to an audience and display and sell your art. So that's happening. Yeah, you know, that's the whole thing with NFTs, you know, non fungible right. tokens. I mean, for the first time, artists can keep track of who buys their work and get commissions, mm -hmm. which is really unfair. That's one thing. You know, if you're a movie star, a musician, you get royalties. Artists don't get royalties. You know, <laughs> they, they sell a painting for $12 when they're starving and then it goes for $12 million. They're not going right. to see any profit. They're just going to see an increase in their reputation. They're not going to see any actual money. Whereas if you're a musician, you have a song in a movie and the movie takes off, you're going to make a lot of money in royalties. Right. That's one That's upside. Point. Plus, you can find your own audience. But the issue, too, is that there's a big glut. Now you have to yes. compete with the whole world. Right. <laughs> you know, so I remember a, a friend of mine, my friend Donna Torella, who's also a painter. One of her teachers, I think, was Carmen Cicero, who was a painter in the 50s. And he said, back then, there were like 12 of us. <laughs> like the whole art world was so small. Back in the 1930s, when the Surrealists were around, there were like 30 galleries in New York. And most of them showed classical art. Now there's like 700 galleries just in Manhattan or something. It's the same in, in the music world. I mean, obviously, the record companies were the gatekeepers. So there's only a certain amount of albums came out every year and that was the the artist's goal was to get a record deal so your music reached the masses or at least have the potential now with spotify and pro tools and computer uh, garage band it is david everybody's a rock star everybody has their own record label everybody right. has their own distribution network so and yes just like you're saying gene in the art world there is just a glut of things out there but there is great there is there is great music out there and there's great art oh there's always going to be you know the thing is it's what hits the mainstream because i like i i remember the last time i got really excited about what was going in the pop scene was in the 90s with grunge okay. my friend larry hyman who is a musician the he's great larry player. hyman the bass player did you know him yeah he said that he he leaves it off at like outcasts that's where she chose his line like that was the last time he got excited but i don't <laughs> think there's a lot to get i guess for the kids now they find it exciting i personally don't find a lot of music that's around now right. really interesting to me. Or a lot well, of Well, that's an interesting thing, Gene. I'm not sure that kids are quote unquote excited. I, 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 I think kids, you would know. Well, yeah. So so what 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 I'm I'm thinking is they're almost stuck. This is what's out there. This is what just like the phone, you 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 don't have to search for anything, really. It's all there. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with it. I, I really do. But there was one really interesting thing that's happened out of COVID. And in a weird way, Sweetwater, which is a musical instrument online um, seller, they sold over a billion dollars in instrument. I want to talk about your book because where you're saying that the art world has become so global, one of the things that your book really points out is that everything is art. And that's really important. I, I think so. Uh, you look at a building. Well, you need an artist to draw the architectural plans. Let's go to that little can of Nutella. Somebody had to come up with the label. The uniform that uh, The Gap and Banana Republic is, that too, had to come from an artist's pen, a designer. And every record you see, art once again. And speaking yeah. of book covers, 
since we've got our um, backdrops, we can't show yours, but we'll put that in the videos in the end. Oh, right, we can. All right. See what I'm saying? Okay. Well, I got mine. I got my copy here. Both. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> I, I could just drag it out tomorrow. That's true. People ask me two questions that come up when I do my lectures and things all the time are what is art and what makes good art. So the first one, I thought about it a lot, especially when I was writing the book. And my definition for art is the manifestation of an idea. That's kind of it. It's like if you have an idea and you do something with it, even if it's just a piece of conceptual art where you say something or mail a letter. Stanley Brown, who is this Dutch conceptual artist from the 60s, had people, he put pieces of paper in the street and had people walk on them without yeah. knowing. And then he'd pick it up and would call it a piece of art. And it was about capturing a moment in time. You know, people were taking part in a piece of art they didn't even know they were. And then he's sort of immortalized their footprints in the same way that they found the oldest human footprints ever found so far were found in a cave in France. You think, well, that, that sounds like such a big deal, oh, the oldest human footprints. But is this really any different just because it's modern? You know, you're still capturing a moment in time. And these are actual right. footprints made by people. So that was a very simple gesture, but it's still art because he manifested it into something. Okay. And art has to always be undefinable because it's always expanding and anything can be art. You know, it is just an idea uh, that you manifest. I think I agree with you there. One of the great things about your book is that you're telling stories about artists. It's interesting going, let's say, and we had this discussion yesterday. Let's say you go to the Louvre and you see the Mona Lisa. Well, the Mona Lisa, you look at it, all right, I just went, saw the Mona Lisa. Great. But you were talking about things like that wasn't really a great painting in terms of it became a popular painting more so. And can you touch upon that, the the, the, the basic difference there? Let's say a great painting and something that's great because it's popular. I think people think art is, you know, immortal, untouchable, holy, this whole thing. But I think in a lot of ways it compares to pop music because it has a lot of co in common with pop music and fashion. Things come and go in and right. out of favor. People like one thing one minute and then dislike it the next minute. A lot of artists <laughs> die obscurity even famous ones mm -hmm. Fragonard Franz Hals uh, they died in obscurity because they went out of style so it's a matter of the Mona Lisa got famous because somebody tried to steal it in like 1911 I think it was and it made headlines and all of a sudden everybody's heard of this painting it wasn't even considered John Berger the uh art writer from, who since passed away wrote something about there was a Leonardo drawing in the National Gallery that an American wanted to buy for what was considered then a huge sum. So it wound up getting its own room in the National Gallery because it was famous for going for such a high price. That was Nat King Cole doing the classic Mona Lisa. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. So you never know why something catches on and why, why do people like any group that is, you know, it just speaks to the time somehow. Yeah. It's an intangible. One of the things you bring out in the art of looking at art, which I find very interesting, it almost makes common sense, is that to understand a piece of art that you're looking at, it's also important to understand the historical context from which it came out of. And you go into that. Talk a little bit about I have, why it's important to understand the history behind the painting. I think, first of all, it makes me nuts when anybody said, oh, it's all about the aesthetic. The thing is, where did that aesthetic come from? Why did people wear big shoulder pads in the 80s? Because they wanted to look big and powerful. Why was like tall hair was very big in the 80s? Why? Because people want to look bigger. And it was all about it read into the times. It reflected the times. So I think fashion and music and art and all these things reflect the times. And the stories are what make it interesting and bring it to life. And that's kind of the point of the book is to make art accessible and to make people realize that it is connected to real life. That was David Bowie doing fashion. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Let's draw a comparison to music, David and uh, Gene. For example, take the album Sgt. Pepper, right? One of the most famous albums in the world. To really enjoy that record. Now, David, you were a teenager when that record came out, 1967. I was all of seven years old, but even seven-year-olds were aware of the Beatles in 1967. And when I listen to that record, I am cognizant of the psychedelic era from which it came, okay? Which was the Summer of Love, 1967. When someone my age hears that record, I can reflect on, yes, 
this is a product of its times. In many ways, it still sounds amazing, but in many ways, it's dated. Now, I've encountered lots of other Beatles fans or music fans, David, some people that we've interviewed, like, for example, John Montagna, who's maybe 50 years old, so he's too young to remember the impact that Sgt. Pepper has. I think he loves that record just because of, let's say, the aesthetic of it. I don't know if he's so cognizant of the, the history behind it. So it's kind of strange how you obviously knowing the history helps you appreciate something, but then there is just some things that just transcend the history and it doesn't matter what time it came out. That was Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, The Reprise, and previous to that, you heard Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the title track and first tune on the record. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. There's a Caravaggio painting called The Card Sharps, and it shows a rich young guy getting ripped off by a couple of Bunko artists. A guy's pulling a card out of his belt, and they're obviously cheating this guy out of his money. I mean, that transcends time. People are, that's happening even as we speak, right, right, as right. I say in the book. But certain things, like, for instance, Kathina was raised Baptist. This is our, our mutual friend. We right, all know right, Kathina, right. of course. She said she was raised Baptist and she doesn't relate to a lot of classical art because it's all about saints. That's just not part of the Baptist religion. You know, that's a very Catholic thing. So why is St. Lucy standing in the painting holding her, holding her eyebrows in a tray? Well, you're not going to understand the painting if you don't understand the story of St. Lucy. She gouged her eyes out rather than ma- marry a pagan and, and renounce her religion, something like that. <laughs> So that's Catholicism. I thought it was St. Lucy and St. Desi, though. I'm not sure. If I... <laughs> it was St. Lucy and St. Ricky. Yeah. Oh, St. Ricky, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Wow. And it was little St. Ricky. <laughs> be in the show ricky right right so yeah. then yes there is obviously historical context does play a role in i guess appreciating some art maybe and some not but yeah i don't think it's necessary i mean you right. can you can look at a painting and say oh i really like the colors i really like you know i relate to that for some reason it's creepy i like it it's happy i like it whatever but i think that's what makes it more interesting i'll put it that way i don't think you have to know right about right. the history and the background but i think it's really what brings art to life and makes you realize that it has to do with real life. When you mention Sergeant Pepper, the first thing that comes to mind, because obviously we're talking with an artist and an art historian, is would that album be as good if it had a brown paper bag versus the cover? And to bring up our Stones issue again, would Satanic Majesties right, be like the record record. that's remembered because of that 3D plate on the cover? Also, a replica of really Sergeant Pepper. That was Why Don't We Sing This Song All Together, a tune from the Satanic Majesty's Requests and Requires, the Stones album that sort of replicated, cover-wise at least, uh, the Beatles' Sergeant Pepper. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. And then let's put this in. Their very next record was the White Album, wasn't it? Right, right. And... The Stones had a white face record as well. So it's interesting how the art reflected the music inside. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Will Sergeant Pepper be remembered just for its music? Or when you say the word Sergeant Pepper, you see this incredible like record cover. cover. Well, cover art is a big part of selling the records, I think. They put a, people put a lot of effort into you know, deciding what's going to be their... Co- well, when people did sell albums, I'm not sure it's that important anymore. There's so many ties between art and music, so many crossovers between artists who were uh, musicians or artists who painted musicians or musicians who were painters. There's all kinds of crossovers. The terminology, even, we discussed this before. Key, harmony, composition, rhythm. And, you know, the rhythms in paintings can be very regular and classical, like the Leonardo behind you is very balanced. Something like a Romare beard collage, which is very almost like jazz and he painted a lot or he did collages of a lot of jazz musicians too and almost the style of the collages is, is that same kind of unbalance that jazz has that same kind of not regularity right. and then there's also <laughs> the black and white photo the black and white painting color photo the color painting how they influence black and white of course film noir mm-hmm. uh, early uh, French new wave film yeah, I think they all reflect each other. Everything ties in. And the thing is, there's a painting I talk about in, in a lot of my lectures, when I talk about our appreciation. You know, you go to see these 
portraits, these classical portraits. Oh, yeah, there's somebody else in a powdered wig, big deal. But then you find out the story of the person, and it can be really fascinating. You find out, because you have to face it, these people were important. That's why they were being painted, and they have a story, too. So once you find out that story, that can be the whole key to a period, you know, to a particular time. Or you can know about a particular time, and then go to a museum and see the real thing. I remember I went to the Clooney Museum in Paris once, which has nothing to do with Georgia Rosemary. It's a (laughs) museum of medieval art. I forget if it was one or two, but they had a shoe. It was a thousand years old. And it was one of the most amazing things. Just It was like a regular shoe, like Joe Average's shoe, one of those little pointy things with the straps that everybody wore. And they didn't even, I don't even think they had left and right shoes back then. And there was this shoe that was just on somebody's foot. And it was so poignant. I almost cried just looking at it because it was so moving somehow. Was so, the foot still in it? Oh, my God. No, no, they, they did have the courtesy to remove the foot. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah, I like when they do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one of the um, other topics uh, you bring up in the book, which I guess will, is, is endless debate, is who decides what is art? And, uh, of course, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when what Andy Warhol did, my elders, that's not art. The Campbell's soup can is an art. They couldn't fathom that as art. And just, uh, David, in, in, in our business, in the music business, hip-hop isn't music. Rock and roll isn't music. So who decides, Gene? Who decides what is art? You say there's not an art mafia. It's, like, total <laughs> fantasy. I mean, just like they're gatekeepers. Sure. It's like in the music business. It is becoming more and more democratic because yeah. as... David pointed out, people have the tools to make art and sell it on their own. And there are artists who are completely bypassing the gallery system. There used to be a time when auction houses only sold dead artists. And now they're starting to sell contemporary artists who make enough bucks, who can draw in a big enough crowd. So you can see it, Damien Hirst, at an art auction, whereas before you would have had to wait till Damien Hirst was dead. Mm. Uh, So it is becoming more spread out and demographic, democratic rather. There are still gatekeepers and tastemakers, but I think it's getting more and more individual. Very transitional, weird period right now. (laughs) Right. We we are in a very right, because now digital media, thanks to COVID, I think has really become more important in our lives because it's, it's really how we connect. And I think David, I don't know who the, or Gene, the, the quote says, if you want to know who owns society, who runs society, look at who pays the artists. I don't know. Was that um, Ginsburg that said that? I don't, I don't recall. I don't know. It brings up a really interesting point. At what point does art become an investment for future versus an investment to put on your wall? I've got a cousin who was a real big deal on Wall Street, and he has a Picasso in his attic. So my question, when did or has it always been when people buy art, which really should be with a Picasso in particular on a wall, when was it termed an investment and an investment only? Or has it always been an investment always? That was drink to me, drink to my health, also known as Picasso's last words. That was Paul McCartney. And this is Notes from an Artist on Cygnus Radio. Art used to be commissioned up until the modern times. That's a point I make in the book, too, is the difference between artists, classical artists were commissioned to make an altarpiece or a statue for the town square. And it was like hiring a high-end decorator. This is what I want. I want a painting of St. Mary and St. Anne with John the Baptist and Jesus. And I want it to be this size. It has to be done by this date. And you're going to paint, you know, paint it, pay you this much for it, whatever. And it was very made to order. But now with modern art, the gallery system got more established and it became slightly more out of the hands of an elite, but they became a different kind of gatekeeper. So to think of it as an, I mean, up until like the 1860s, 1800s, whatever, I think it was more like just you ordered it. It was like buying something, you ordered it, and it wasn't necessarily an investment. It was something you ordered and had. Uh, so maybe as time went on, and I think the 80s was a big turning point too. That that was, I think, when really the auction houses, like that's when the, the Van Gogh went for $83 million or $86.9 million, and people were all up in arms about it. I think that's when the real turning point was, uh, because up until then, I think you could still get a lot of art fairly cheaply. I remember I, when I used to clean apartments, I worked for Phil Perlstein and Dorothy Cantor, his wife, who was also a painter, and uh 
house was full of antiquities, little statues they picked up in Europe in the 50s when nobody wanted them because people wanted modern art. They wanted Philip Pearlstein's art, actually, you know, or, or Andy Warhol's art. But that's when they went to Europe and collected all these antiquities. So as far as when it became a real investment, I would say the turning point was really the 1980s. Yeah, because that's when the, the big art boom happened and the big art bust happened right afterwards. Prior to that, I think it was much more about the art. And I forget, there was some famous dealer... I forget who, who it was, but she made, this was like probably about 20 years. She made the statement she couldn't deal art anymore because it was all about investment. I was talking about how much money everything's worth. That, but how, and so I think I would say the 80s probably was when that big turnaround was made. When I spoke with my cousin about it, I said, art's meant to be displayed. It's not meant to be put in the attic for a future time. And then, of course, I didn't ask him this, but it, it would have been a great question. When's that time? When then do you take that down? Is it to sell it to someone else who puts it in an attic as well? A hermetically sealed attic? A it's lot. really kind of bizarre when you think about it. A lot of art disappears. Though. The guy who bought uh, the portrait of Dr. Gachet by Van Gogh, uh, some Japanese businessman, said he wanted to be buried with it. And we don't know if that ever happened, but nobody's ever seen the painting again. Salvatore Mundi, the, the, the Leonardo painting that got sold to uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, that just disappeared too. Nobody knows where that is. He paid a half a billion dollars. But you know, David, the, the concept of the art as investment in Gene, again, we'll go back to what you say about the history look at the 80s. I mean, this is when kids started putting baseball cards in little glass cases. Not like when I, my generation, where we used to flip them and put them on bicycle spokes and hang right, them in our right. lockers. So, right, things became, right, it, it was a money era. It was the, right, it was the era of money, of Wall Street, big business. So, art reflected that. You didn't, you appreciated art for what it was worth, not, not necessarily the aesthetic. So, once again, history playing an important role of in determining what is great art. Pounds, dollar. That was How to Be a Millionaire by ABC. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I remember reading some newsletter by an art marketing guy, and he said, when you really think about it, what do people know? First of all, how many artists have household name status? You know, about half a dozen, a dozen maybe. And if you name, say the name Picasso, what do people know about Picasso? The name Picasso. Unless you're really in the art world, can you name any of his paintings, Leonardo, Mona Lisa, you know, Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel. But how many people, like I said the other day too, we were talking about people, there's the Mona Lisa right behind it. There's another Leonardo that nobody looks at in the loop because they don't know it's there because they don't want to see the Mona Lisa. <laughs> also, I mean, you go to a museum now, it's kind of obnoxious. You can't even get in front of Starry Night because there's always 50 people in front of it. Right. One of the guards told me a story once that some kid, I guess on a bed or I don't know, for whatever reason, he just wanted to have a selfie taken of him smoking a joint or a blunt in front of Starry Night. So he lit up a blunt in front of Starry Night. His friend snapped a picture and they ran out of the museum real quick. <laughs> I guess, I don't know if they got caught or not, but I thought that was a pretty funny. So just to have the selfie of me smoking a blunt in front of Starry Night, that's all I live for. Well, you know, you're absolutely right, Gene, because what, what's the first thing people think about when they think, think about Van Gogh? He cut off his ear. Right. Yeah. You know. <laughs> So really, unless you're in the world, I mean, if you say the Beatles, I can, you know, people can name some hits, but how many people know their raw, obscure music or whatever, you know right. what I'm saying? I remember one time, well, it was a long time ago already, but I was telling you some 20 something, I mentioned David Bowie. He's like, isn't he the guy who did Dancing with Myself? <laughs> you know, and I, I mean, it really hurt my family. I was crying, but it was just like, it just goes to show. And David Bowie had so many hits, you know, and he thinks he's Billy Idol. That was Billy Idol with Generation X doing Dancing with Myself. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. <laughs> yeah, um, I think Billy Idol thinks he's David Bowie, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's all, uh, uh, one of the uh, topics David and I always touch upon with musicians, and, and certainly relates to what you do, is does an artist need to be formally trained? Now, when David and I grew up in the when the earth was still cooling, if you wanted to learn how to play an instrument, you went to what was known as a teacher, and they would write these things, these little balls on a page with sticks on them called notes, and you learned how to read music, and you learned music theory. So you understood why these notes sounded the way they did and things like that. But then as, as time progressed and again, digital technology became more and more prevalent, people didn't really need to learn how to read music or understand music theory. They can pick it up, they can plug it in and they can start making music. And some musicians are quite proficient, all, even though they don't read a note on a page or they don't, they don't understand music theory. They do it all by ear. What say you in the, in the art world? I mean, is it, uh, is it necessarily to be trained or 
Is it better not to be trained? That's, a, that's, that's a sticky question because yeah. I had real, real academic training. I mean, we would spend literally 90 hours on one drawing, drawing, we learned anatomy. People went, I mean, I didn't go to the New York Academy full time and do this, but a lot of people, um, they had to build an ecorche, build a model up muscle by muscle in clay. So they knew all the anatomy. It took me a long time to finally let go of all that because I didn't really want to do that. I want, right. but I wanted to know that I could if I wanted to. Right. And that's been a good thing because now I can teach art to people who want to learn how to draw. So I've been, it actually benefited me because now I can make a living doing this, teaching to right. draw, even though what I do doesn't really show necessarily out of proficiency on purpose because mm-hmm. I kind of want that feeling. But I think of classical musicians who incorporated folk melodies into their symphonies. True. Or you think about Frank Zappa in the 70s signing Alice Cooper and the GTOs in Captain Beefheart. Now that's something you don't hear every day. The GTO is doing I'm in Love with the Ooh Ooh Man. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. There's always been sort of, I think, an interest in people who, with modern art, from the 1850s, I think that started. Because that's when a lot of the Impressionists had academic training. Edward Manet was not particularly a great painter as far as training goes, but he was very revolutionary important. So I think that's kind of when it started really that Mm-hmm. You didn't necessarily have to have training. Sometimes training can ruin a good thing. Like with Henri Rousseau, who you were talking about before, David. You said you wanted right, to talk right. about Henri Rousseau. Picasso took a great liking to Rousseau, kind of tongue-in-cheek. You know, they threw a big dinner in his honor. Uh, and Apollinaire and Gertrude Stein and Picasso were all there. And it was all very tongue-in-cheek, but at the same time, they kind of admired what he did. And if he learned how to paint for real, he probably would have been less of a good artist because he would have lost that freshness that he has in quote-unquote naive painter. That was Michael Franks doing Tiger in the Rain, which has the great Ron Carter on bass. But there's something interesting about this tune. It's based on the Henri Rousseau painting Tiger in a Tropical Storm. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. It's important. I think it's good to have training. I like when people can actually do their job. But then again, you do have to make room for other schools. Like I have a huge fondness for what they call bad art. There is a museum of bad art in Boston and they show thrift store paintings, which I love. I have about 15 thrift store paintings in my studio that I bought for 20 bucks and they're, they're God awful, but they have so much charm to them. That's what I find interesting about them. Then are they really awful? If you like them and you treasure them. Technically they're pretty bad. Yeah. (laughs) But, But they have so much personality and charm like there's one of three ducks swimming in a lake and the ducks are just like a completely identical like sort of duck shaped lines and then in the background the t- branches of trees are crooked so the owls are all crooked too because they didn't know how to paint the owls upright sitting on a crooked branch <laughs> so the crooked owls kind of make it you know and that's what gives it its charm if they had painted it painted it better it would have not been as good it's a gallery in boston that also collects the same stuff. Oh, that's great. Back in the 70s, when everyone was destroying hotel rooms and rock and roll bands, one of the bands I was in, we had something we called Art Critic. And what would happen is you'd go into a Holiday Inn or this, that, and the other thing, and you'd see Venus Paradise paintings on the walls. Uh, So what we would do is we'd throw them. Uh, And, and, you know, because we were art critics, of course. Uh, And... uh, I can tell you, if they if they remember my name, I'm not allowed back at the Holiday Inn in Hainesville, <laughs> Ohio. That's a real rarity from Gene Simmons' solo record called Living in Sin at the Holiday Inn. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I think one of the things that w- comes with that education, and we know this from uh, when I studied music at University of Miami, there were rules. This chord is being played, then you play this note. And then you analyze, once you learn how to read music and you understand music theory, and you listen to the greats and you say, my God, they're breaking all the rules left and right. Remember what Charlie Parker said, very similar to what Picasso says, learn everything you possibly can, get up on the bandstand and play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. An artist once told me, you know, you should never be hampered by what you can't do. Ooh, I like that. Like you should never, if you, if you want to do something, you should learn that skill. You know, there's a lot of artists who work in really weird mediums. Like you have Rachel White Reed, who's a British artist, and she won the Turner Prize back in the 90s. And she casts the insides and undersides of things, what's called the negative space. So she will cast the underside of a set of stairs in concrete or the interior of a house. And then the house gets peeled away and you're left with a cement sculpture of the interior of a house. And there's no art school in the world that's going to teach you how to cast the inside of a house in concrete. So she had to experiment and she had a lot of failures, but eventually she did it and she got the results she wanted because she had to go through a learning curve. If I wanted to learn how to make prints, I would have to learn how to make prints because I don't really know how to do prints. Uh That would be a whole new skill. Just because I can paint doesn't mean... That's the other thing. People think you go to art school and you learn art. You do not go to art school and learn art. Go to art school and you learn sculpture. You learn commercial graphic design. You learn painting. You know, you specialize just like a doctor. You get a base core and then you go into your specialty so people say like, oh can we hire you to do caricatures at our wedding i'm like well i'm not a caricature artist <laughs> right right oh then i guess you're not a very good artist <laughs> no it's not a good caricature artist <laughs> david and i have been doing several studio musicians of renown i mean their resumes would blow you away yet when, when i sit and talk with some of them they wish they could play with the reckless abandon of let's say a punk rocker one of my favorite drum fills of all time is in that song that was god save the queen by the sex pistols this is no Notes from an artist on CygnusRadio.com. You're absolutely right. There are specialties, and it's the same in the music world. And I think people are starting to appreciate music that they didn't consider music back in the day, such as hip-hop and punk rock, or even rock and roll in general, and that, wow, this is something substantial. And right, just because we talk bass players, and, and I say that when I started playing bass in 1976, two bass players came to prominence, Jaco Pistorius and D.D. Ramon of the Ramones. And you think about it, and who who more influential than the Ramones as a rock and roll band, right? How many bands started because of the Ramones? And then you have Jaco Pastorius who who transformed what the bass, uh, the scope of the instrument. Yeah, Jaco would have failed an audition for the Ramones, and uh, I don't think D.D. Ramon would have been a very good bass player in, in uh, Weather Report. So, oh, I would disagree with you. I think Jaco was the D.D. Ramon of fusion. Right. <laughs> well, he Seriously. was. No, he was a punk rocker in. Yes, he was the D.D. Ramon of jazz. But to actually play in the Ramones to do I Want to Be Sedated the way D.D. does it. And D.D. who used to write their songs, by the way. You know what I'm saying? The idea is that, you know, yes, Jocko was who he was and specialized in what he did. Yet just because D.D. Ramon was more primal, I don't see I see them as equals in a sense. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And of course, I was highly educated what is... But you don't want to use a hammer to do what a screwdriver should be doing. I defy you to tell me that you've ever heard punk jazz by Weather Report followed by Chinese rocks by the Ramones. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I want to get back to the book again because besides being fantastic... And as our listeners know, um, Tom and I are actually weirdos. We actually read books. And we usually read them from cover to cover. So that brings up two things. First of all, the title of the book, The Art of Looking at Art. When you think about that, you can really change some names around. As, As we've spoken before, The Art of Listening to Music. The Art of Looking at Dance. The Art of Looking and Listening to Theater. There is an art to it and it's the art is exactly what people need there's a book by mortimer adler how to read a book so the guidance that is necessary to be informed is an art yeah well you know people also make this big deal about i don't understand modern art and i always point out to them well you don't understand classical art either just because you recognize it like i was talking about kathina not getting a lot of classical art because it's all saints. Right. You know, you see, let's just play devil's advocate. You see a painting of a crucifixion. Okay, if you're a Christian or pretty much anybody in the Western world, you know what the crucifixion represents, the, at least the basic story behind it. But let's say you had no idea what the crucifixion was about. What would you see? You would see a painting of somebody hanging off of two pieces of wood and why. Art has to be explained in terms of culture too. For instance, we always think of in the classical 
times in Europe, artists all came from the lower classes or the working classes because nobles didn't paint. Whereas in China, it's just the opposite. Art mm -hmm. was a recreational activity for the nobles because they had the time to study and the working people did not. So flex the culture in those ways too. And that helps understand everything. And you know, everything about like, hey, why are these people doing this, this in this painting? Well, because it represents this. For instance, there's a painting by Bruegel of Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem for the census where they gave birth to Jesus. And it was also a political statement about the Spanish occupation of the Netherlands and the bureaucracy that was involved because Mary and Joseph could not find a hotel to stay in, you know, an inn to stay in, not a hotel, they didn't have hotels, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and uh, maybe they did, I don't know, motor logic. But um, <laughs> so the idea that it's a political statement too would be lost on you if you didn't, on, nobody told you that. Right. But if yeah. you were from... The Netherlands back then, you probably would have gotten it. There's a lot of in-jokes in paintings that people don't necessarily get. Things that are of their time. Right, again, historical context, so important. It's the 1950s. You've got William Burroughs chopping up words, mm -hmm. throwing them all together. How much different is that from a Jackson Pollock painting? Right. Well, you know, it was something new at the time, and it, it, it reflected the times in many ways, politically, you know, what Jackson Pollock did or any of the abstract expressionists. It was the first time America was on top of the art world. Some people think that it was a propaganda tool for the CIA because it, it <laughs> showed that America had culture as well as military might. Right. It also just reflected the angst and the Marlon Brando-ness and the James Dean-ness of the time, the rebel without a cause. Because right. Jackson Pollock was the closest, as I say in the book, to the art world ever came to a cowboy. Right. You know, he was a rebellious artist. He was, you know, right. Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning. They had certain things in common. But then you also have Mark Rothko, which is nothing like Jackson Pollock. It's not that. He's yeah. very calm. Ad Reinhardt was an abstract expressionist, and he painted solid black canvases. Mm -hmm. They were very meticulous, layer after layer of paint. And they're nothing alike, but they have that label of abstract expressionist that just kind of gives it a context and something that people can tie themselves into. That was the Rolling Stones doing the approach appropriately titled Paint It Black. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I think Jackson Pollock, right, where you say rebellious artist, really Jackson reflected his time. So in a sense, he is rebellious to the establishment. Now we have the benefit of history to look back on that, just like when the Beatles did Sgt. Pepper, that was something radical. But now it sounds very tame today. But, but when you put it in its historical context, and I think maybe that's the same thing with Jackson Pollock. Yes, it is art, but in 1955. Well, some people don't realize, like even the difference between they'll look at a Michelangelo and a Caravaggio and they'll say, oh, yeah, they're paintings of religious scenes, whatever, yeah. but they won't understand what a shift that meant in the zeitgeist. Okay. Because Caravaggio, you know, had a kind of violence and bloodiness in his paintings that never would have stood in the Renaissance. I said in the book, like anybody who dies in a Raphael painting dies beautifully, like a swan dying in a ballet. There's no blood and guts at all. They're just kind of peacefully hanging off a crucifix. Right. Saint Sebastian is just standing there kind of, you know, in a daze, kind of very calmly, filled full of arrows. It's kind of, they took all the blood and guts out of it, but people would look at that now and just say, oh, well, they wouldn't really necessarily notice what a big difference that was. In the 1600s, people would have noticed it was a huge difference right, sure. between what Michelangelo or Raphael did and what Caravaggio did 100 years later. Yeah. So sort of like it becomes classical by comparison compared to Jackson Pollock because Caravaggio and Michelangelo had a lot more in common than, say, Caravaggio and Jackson Pollock. You have to realize how radical it was at the time. Like nobody was doing You hear that all the time in the art world. Nobody was doing that then or they were the first one to. Yeah. So, and that matters a lot because it is a new way of seeing that's also been incorporated into society overall. I said something in the in the book about, you know, the colors in a Ellsworth Kelly painting wind up being in the packaging for a kitchen sponge. Everything kind of makes it into the, the larger world eventually right. in some form. Gene, do you think that uh, artists look at art differently than, let's say, non-artists? I know you maybe you tried to bridge that in the book. I used to have this debate with my ex-wife, who was a very prominent psychologist nowadays. And I was like, no, musicians listen to music differently. They listen to it more as a language, I think. Uh, do you think artists or people with an art artistic inclination view art differently than, let's say, a civilian like myself? Definitely. Yeah. That was the Beatles with I'm Looking Through You from the album Rubber Soul. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I mean, unless you've done it, you can't really understand like just how hard it is to work in watercolor. Right. You know, you don't necessarily understand all the effort that went into casting a bronze statue, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So you're, you're going to understand it from a technical viewpoint that anybody else just probably isn't going to, unless they've at least attempted it on their own. So, so the question becomes, is that important for the layman to know? Meaning, how many hours I spend 
do 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 does it matter? Uh, how many um, hours LeBron James practiced his free throws? Right, yeah. No, well, the thing is, if really good story that, that Whistler said about, there's a whole story about this painting that he presented that was trash. He took the critic to court for libel. And as a result of this whole court trial, he wound up making a statement about what you're paying for isn't this painting. What you're paying for is the experience of a lifetime. Right. So by being able to study that much, you can then kind of throw it away or you can draw a hand in like two minutes where somebody else might really struggle over it. But I think if you're going to be in the art field, even as a critic or as a historian, it probably is a good idea to take at least some art lessons. I mean, anybody can relate to what it's like to work hard at something you really want to do. They might be a horse trainer or they might be a parent. You know, you just say, think about what it was like to raise your child. That's the yeah. same way it is to be an artist. Right. That's to be a full-time devoted job and you put all this time into it and you really have to be dedicated to it. And I think then maybe people understand if you relate to something that, they can, that they've done that's hard for themselves. And because then on the flip side- I just thought of that. <laughs> I just made that I like up. That. That. I like that. I was just going to think though, you don't have to send your artwork to college though. <laughs> True. But um, but on the flip side of that, I think music, especially, and one of the reasons I went into music journalism, uh, although it was more accidental, but that'll be in my interview, is that so many music journalists have never picked up an instrument and they have no idea what it's like to be in a band. They have no idea what it is to write a hit song and then have to live off that hit song the rest of your life because hit songs don't come to most of us. So I, you know, I see that a lot in music criticism or music journalism, which Frank Zappa said the best. It's people who can't write, uh, interviewing people who can't talk for people who can't read. <laughs> so much of music journalism is frustrating for me to read because I know from reading this writer, and this could be published in major outlets, that you've never picked up an instrument. What the hell do you know? You don't get it. I criticize somebody who's, you know, been on the nostalgia circuit for 30 years. Oh, well, give it up. But you don't realize that's how he pays his bills. Like the Paul Simon movie, One Trick Pony, he keeps singing that hit song over and over again because that's how he sustains himself. I remember Ruth Brown talking about Mama, He Treats Your Daughter Mean being her bread and butter. That was Ruth Brown doing Hey Mama, He Treats Your Daughter Mean. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I actually got to work with Ruth Brown. And yes, you, she, may I touch you someday? No, no, well, not to play. I was I worked in a publicist. I did get to play with her a little bit in the office, just doing simple one, four, five blues. So many people who write about about art, or what I've read, I, well, in music especially, they've never picked up an instrument. So really, who the hell are they to tell me? Impart this to the rest of us. And then that's taken as gospel. That's taken as the way it is. I would think that certainly happens in the art world all too. Well, I, I don't know. I know Jerry Saltz has admitted to being a failed artist himself, which I think is really big of him to admit. And I like a lot of Jerry Saltz's writing, actually. I think he's mm -hmm. really very astute about judging art. Is it necessarily? I, I don't know. I, it'd be nice, I guess, if you understand yeah. what people went through. But I don't know. Well, I don't know what makes somebody into a critic necessarily. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, I wrote this book because I was doing art seminars. I got laid off from my day job back in 2008. And that's how I got into teaching because it was kind of necessity. Somebody suggested doing seminars and then I read a book on seminars. They said, well, if you do seminars, you should have some, so have, always have something to sell, some kind of recording or a book or something. He said, I can write a book in two years. It took seven. <laughs> uh, I learned so much. But so I didn't really intend to become a writer. I just did it to have something to accompany my seminars. And I didn't think it was going to be so much work, but then it took on a life of its own. I got more and more and more into it. That was, I could write a book by Frank Sinatra. This is Notes from an Artist at CygnusRadio.com. So let me pose a question here. Last night I was I was reading a BBC classical music magazine and because of iTunes and everything, when someone recommends a record or something like that, I'll put that down, you know, put it on the, the phone and everything. So the question is this, I have all of this material, I'm sort of worn out listening. I know that's a weird thing to say, but I don't listen like I used to listen. Do you view paintings like you used to view paintings? if that makes any sense. I can look forever at a painting sometimes. I remember I went on a trip to London with my mother a few years back, probably more than a few years by now. I remember she didn't feel, she was kind of tired and she stayed in the hotel. So I went to the National Gallery by myself. I spent two hours in front of one Rubens painting, just looking at how it was painted, what was going on, every little detail. You know, so I can, you know, I don't necessarily, but I think sometimes I might be quicker to dismiss things because I'm kind of like, oh, no, whatever. You know, with something with substance, I will, you know, I mean, Kathina and I sat and watched an entire Ryan 
Ryan Treecarton video once. It was three hours long or something. Though I can do it still, maybe not to the degree, but if something does interest me, I will do it. And do you still get excited about certain works of art, still new works of art? What excites you now when you when you seek new art? You know, I'm a little out of the loop, I have to admit, because of well, obvious reasons. No, I can still get excited by art if I feel like there's something happening. Sure. But it's also, you know, I make the point too that the art you like reflects you as much as it reflects the art. Why do I like certain artists? Because right. they speak to me. What's really good is if somebody can make you like something that you don't relate. I think that's when somebody's, you know, like when a teacher can teach math, which is a subject I'm not particularly interested in, if they can make math interesting, I think they're a great teacher. And that's what a teacher ought to be able to do. And I think that's what an artwork ought to be able to do too. It's like, if you can turn me on to your life, if you can show me something about your life or your culture or your whatever, and I learn something from it, then yeah, that's a good thing. Do you find yourself going back in the artist you didn't care for maybe 40 years ago now you greatly appreciate? Oh yeah, your tastes always change. Don't, don't your taste change? Yeah, that's what I, with the benefit we talk about, David and I talk about Sirius XM and Deep Tracks, and I just say... Boy, I never really appreciated that 40 years ago, but man, that's an amazing piece of music. Well, the thing is also, I remember when I was a kid, you weren't, you weren't supposed to like certain stuff. It was uncool right. to like certain stuff. <laughs> and now people are like flagrantly running around saying, oh, Karen Carpenter had such a great voice, but back then you weren't really allowed to like the Carpenters. Right, were, sure. You know, or well, you know what I think also with that, I think as budding musicians, we may not listen to the lyrics as much as we do now mm -hmm. because we were trying to learn our instrument. And so we were focused focused more on the instrumental aspect of a tune and now a song will come on and did they really say that you know because <laughs> you really weren't paying attention you know yeah. it's interesting the lyrics are interesting because i remember uh somebody from new order once saying like they didn't care what the lyrics were as long as they sounded good <laughs> and i mean there's poetry that is based only on the sounds of the words and not on the right. meaning so there is that too you know sometimes it's just because it sounds good or just because it may not be right in the real world but it's right in the, in the artwork yeah, so yeah, yeah that's too. True too. one thing i wanted you to comment on also is david and i music education has been greatly affected by uh, digital technology now you know back in our day as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, David and I, we had to go to teachers and maybe you would go to a concert and watch the masters and you only saw them for maybe an hour and a half. And that was it. You had to remember what it is. Talk about the present and the future of art education now with digital media. Does that make for a deeper learning experience now that you can see some of the masters at work and you can go back and reference it anytime you like? Looking at an artwork in person is a whole different thing from looking at it in a reproduction, whether it's in a book or whatever. You just can't get into an artwork in a book the same way you can in right. person. Digital art is kind of here to stay, I think. I was talking about this with my friend Greg, uh, who's also a painter, and we were talking about the whole NFT thing. It's the idea that you have this piece of art that has to be digital and who owns it. And we decided it's probably just going to be another aspect. People have predicted that painting is dead for decades now. <laughs> Realistic art is dead for decades. You know, oh, painting is dead. Realism is dead. No, it's not. People are always going to want to paint. Right. People are always going to want to make things with their hands. People are always going to want to play instruments with their hands. But one thing that's interesting, back this is just kind of apropos of nothing, but with art, with music education, apparently part of the reason for uh, the rise of hip hop is the fact that they don't teach instruments in schools a lot anymore. Right, and they would scratch records and take turntables yeah. and turn them into instruments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, were working with what they had, and the same thing with graffiti artists. They didn't have access to oil paints and canvases, so. They they use spray paint and they a lot of them have a lot a great deal of talent there's a lot of really good graffiti artists out there yeah. so it's it's all a different you know it's and it's also different cultures different people produce different kinds of art in some instances technique is really important and some not less so right 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 an exact correlation to music yeah what is technique well, right sometimes again too much technique can hurt you like sometimes people get so hung up on the nose that, that they, they lose all the feeling you know right. do that either True. Well, this was great, Gene. Well, this is you. great. This was great. I enjoyed uh, it. We will see you soon. I don't know what's going to happen with all this COVID, but we'll I'll probably see you at Katina's birthday party. We're playing on January 12th. Mm -hmm. Oh, and let me um, say one thing that will add in. If you're interested in learning more about art, Gene's doing a two week live at Queen's Public Library. Queen's Library. You want to give them all the info on that? You can go to the Queen's Public Library site and, you know, look at their programming and you'll find the listing for it. It's going to be January 11th and 18th, 18th. 6 to 6. 7.30, and it's an art history course. It's a very quick rundown of the history of Western art 
all the way from the Stone Age to the beginning of the 20th century. I've done this a few times, so believe me, it does work. <laughs> I'm going to be there. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's there. an hour and a half each. It's in two sessions. And the first session is from the Stone Age, I think, to the Renaissance. And the second one's the Renaissance to modern times. All right. So cool. thanks for throwing that in. Thank you. A lot of plugging, lot of plugging going on here. <laughs> all right. All right, gentlemen. I'm going to peace out and down, start downloading files. Good work, Jim. Thank you, you so too. much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. So I guess I'm, yeah, good to I see you guys. And there you have it. I want to thank Gene Wisniewski and, of course, my partner in crime, Tom Semioli, for another fabulous and informative interview. I would encourage all of you to pick up Gene's great book, The Art of Looking at Art, published by Roman and Littlefield. And I would also encourage you, if you've missed any of our previous shows or want to listen again, we invite you to our podcast, also titled Notes from an Artist, which you can find on all major podcast players or at notesfromanartist.buzzsprout.com. So this is David Gross for Tom Semioli. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. 